Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, please bless Daniel as he brings the message and quicken our hearts to receive. Amen. The scripture this morning is taken from Genesis 21, 1 to 7, Acts 1, 1 to 8, and Galatians 6, 7 to 9. Hear the word of the Lord from Genesis. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son that Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. From the Acts of the Apostles. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. From the letter of Paul. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. This is the word of the Lord. I remember as a parent, when the kids were little, trying to negotiate promise making. And when the kids are little, if you say we're going to do something, it's heavenly law. You know, if it's something good. If it's punishment, maybe not. But if it's something good, you say, we're going to the zoo, we're going to the park, we're going to have this treat. You got you to gotta do it. You got to have it. The kids are going to be really a wreck. And I remember, you know, when they're little, trying to, to hold off to tell them what good thing is going to happen until it's pretty darn sure it's going to happen. And so that, I tried to make it that way. When I was a kid, I don't remember the promises being given to me, but I remember their fulfillment. Um, I can just compare two things, camping and Disneyland. <laughs> I went to Disneyland once as kind of a young kid and once as a high school kid on a choir tour. And it was great, it's wonderful. Space Mountain, and Splash, Log Ride, and all those fun things. But you know what I really loved was camping. Now, you know, camping, sleeping in a tent, eating smoky pancakes, and fishing all day long. It's better than Disneyland, all right? I loved it. 
I don't remember when the parents promised that we were going camping, but I'm sure they didn't throw me in the car blindfolded and I ended up at the campsite. They must have told us, so I must have been excited. Well, God keeps his promises, and today we have a, a, an interesting convergence of promises kept. The promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised, I will pour out my spirit. The Holy Spirit's coming. You wait. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and when it comes, you'll have the power to be my witnesses to the uttermost ends of the earth. God promised to Abraham, go to the land, I'll show you 25 years before Isaac was born. Go to the land, I'll show you, I'll make you a great nation. And then a year before Isaac was born, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, Sarai's name to Sarah, said to Abram, you'll be the father of many nations. Abraham said to Sarai, you'll be the mother of many nations. Sarah. And, you know, I, I honestly think that it's no coincidence, God is a God of timing. You know, day of Pentecost, you count 50 days and it's Pentecost. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they waited, they waited, they waited. And then when God said it would happen, it happened. And today we have Susan Dayton, the great, great granddaughter of S. Hall Young. And the, what's represented there is the birth of the church in the Chilkat Valley. That's the beginning of the church in Chilkat Valley. They were hungry to hear the gospel. Standing room only, it was big. Uh, and now I think we're given a, a choice about how we're going to respond as God's people in this season of our church, of the church, Christians in the Chilkat Valley. Will we... Will we uh, keep on? Will we persevere? Will we keep going or will we grow weary? Will we keep growing and will we grow weary? Will we be born again as God's people in this time and place? I think we're in a time of testing or will we lose heart? I'm going to come back to that at the end. But I see these things coming together uh, and it can't be coincidence. You know, I didn't plan for this. I wasn't thinking Pentecost. I was thinking 31 weeks in Genesis. And then I realized on Mother's Day, well, I better talk about Sarah on Mother's Day. So that changed the order of things. So now we've got the birth of Isaac on the birthday of the church, where we're looking at the birth of Christianity in the Chilkat Valley. Must be a purpose to it. Well, let's take a look at these passages and hopefully come to a pretty clear conclusion at the end about how our hearts are supposed to respond and what's supposed to happen in us as individuals and in this congregation and in the Christian community here in Haines right now. First of all, I want to say that Sarah, the mother of many nations, is a picture of the church. St. Cyprian in the third century said, you can't have God as your father unless you've got the church as your mother. And the church is the mother of many nations. We've got, in, in this congregation, we've got multiple continents and many Nationalities, Of course, the United States is a nation of nations. And it's a, a clear picture of the church where in prophecy it says that in, the, in heaven, and it will be in the final moments as well, in heaven there's a, a multitude, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And when the final judgment and the final kingdom comes, around God's throne will be every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's the end game. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. And it will be because the church is a mother of many nations. But like Sarah, the church could not be the witness to Jesus Christ to the utter ends of the earth without the power of the Holy Spirit. It just can't be done by clever thinking and smart planning and great talent and skill and getting everybody to line up in a row like good little ducklings. It takes the work of God. It took the work of God. These disciples had seen Jesus do the miracles. They'd even done miracles because of Jesus. But they had to wait until the power of God fell on them and clothed them. And then 3,000 were added to their number in one day. Now, with Sarah and Abraham, there's a subplot that we haven't read about. We're thinking these passages in Genesis to keep it down to 31 weeks. You can go for quite a while. Uh, but, but there's a subplot of when Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting, got tired of having faith. It had been, I think, about 10 years since God first said to Abram, 
Go to this place, I'll make you a father. Ten years later, ten years is a lot of time to wait. You think, all right, you know, baby, no baby, no baby. So Sarah, who is feeling the ultimate pressure, Sarah, who is uh, feel, feeling condemned by her circumstances, started to just become anxious. And she said to Abraham, I'll call him Abraham, why don't you have a baby through my servant? And uh, she's young and probably fertile. And, you know, that way God's promise can be fulfilled if we do what we think is best, act in our own strength. And she did. The Apostle Paul makes a big deal about this. He says, uh, religion without the spirit is like the, the uh, child born to the slave. It's slavery. Being religious without the Holy Spirit is slavery. Just being constantly worried about looking good to other Christians and meeting people's expectations and trying to do enough to please God. It's slavery. But the real Christian life is life in the spirit. The child of the free woman. You, Paul says you, there's two things. There's uh, human religion, fleshly religion, soulish and fleshly, earthly, sensual religion, and then it's life in the spirit. It doesn't mean that this isn't religious, that we're having a religious service right now, but it means it's useless without the Holy Spirit. There's no getting from point A to the end point that God's calling us to, that God's calling you to in your life, and God's calling the worldwide church to. There's no getting God's mission fulfilled without the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no transformation. There's no new life. It comes by the Spirit. So Sarah is a picture of the church, and she had a miracle baby. Because of that miracle baby, the nation of Israel was born, and the miracle baby Jesus was born, born of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary. And that's how our salvation has come. But it came through waiting. Pentecost is a day of waiting. It's really the, the Israel, uh, Hebrew festival, Shavuot. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but it's a festival that isn't called Pentecost. Pentecost is a nickname because uh, Penta means 50, and that's how many days they would count until it was time for the festival. It's a day of waiting. It's a day of waiting and promises fulfilled. Isaac is the child of promise. They waited, they waited, they waited. 25 years later, the promise is fulfilled. And that's why I pulled Galatians chapter 6 in. Paul's talking about religion and spirit, and he's talking about waiting. He's talking about sowing seeds. And as we know from planting our gardens, is that everybody plant? Anyone who's planted a garden, you put your seeds in, it's about the time the seeds are in, right? Now you got to wait. It's freezing outside. Nothing's going to grow like this, but eventually, eventually, There'll be a harvest eventually. It's about waiting. Now, look, before I get into uh, the Galatians passage, we touched on Pentecost, we touched on Genesis and Sarah, and I'm going to touch on the Galatians passage in a moment. Let me just talk briefly about the things that we're waiting for as Christians. Uh, we are waiting to be good. <laughs> And this is going to be the second sermon that Brother Kevin's been in in just a few short weeks. But we had our men's Bible study a few weeks ago, talking about Abraham and Sarah and waiting. I said, what are we waiting for? And Kevin said, holiness. You can just kind of feel the goodness of God in the room just in that moment. It's, it's true. I mean, this is Kevin talking. Kevin who was in prison. Kevin who was addicted to drugs. Kevin who only is shepherding God's flock today because some the hard-headed Christians wouldn't give up on him. Hard-headed Christians. He threw the food back in their faces and cussed them out time and time again. Because God's Spirit was in them, they said, no. Our God is a God of the promise. He does the impossible. We're not giving up. Kevin said it, holiness. A former drug addict who's a pastor said holiness. That's something we're waiting for. Goodness. We're waiting for global holiness. God can take a rock and make it holy. There's objects in the Old Testament. They're holy. Candlesticks, holy. The oil, holy. The altar, holy. He's going to take planet Earth with a California sized batch of garbage in the ocean right now. Or, you know, a big bunch of plastic floating around the ocean. Toxic waste, all the, you know, problems. 
It's going to be holy, the whole place, so holy that God says, that's where I want to live. God started living here. At the end of the Bible, God lives here again. The whole planet's going to be holy. The whole planet's going to be good. You'll have to look under every rock to find a villain, and you won't find one anywhere. Where's Mussolini? Where's Hitler? Where's Mao? Where's all the people that kill millions of people just to make themselves feel good? Where are they? They're gone. The whole world is good. The whole world's at peace. We've got sophisticated weapons that cost billions of dollars. And we're going to have some kind of sophisticated agriculture because the swords and the spears will be torn, turned into plows and plowshares and pruning hooks. No GMOs, <laughs> no mRNA, lettuce, whatever it is. No microplastics and forever chemicals. You won't eat a credit card with the plastic every year. It's going to be good. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be good. And if the Alpha Course food tasted good, food in the kingdom is going to taste better. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're going to have peace. Internal peace. Not just world peace, but right in here peace. All the time. Never that peace, and then all of a sudden you start thinking about what you forgot. <laughs> peace. We're going to find out whether we're 30, 60, or 100. Jesus talked about a foolish farmer who wasted 75% of his seed, throwing it on the path, throwing it in the thorns, throwing it on the rocky soil. But some of it fell in good soil, and that good soil produced a, a crop 30, 60, or 100 fold. You're going to know someday if you're 30, 60, or 100. There's a cool old gospel song that says, uh, Lord, I'm running, trying to make 100, because 99 and a half won't do. That's a hard saying. You know, I want 100 fold, 100 fold. 99 and a half won't do. Another good sentimental song is, uh, thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm a life that was changed. It's about a person who's up in heaven and the people come to him up in heaven. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for what you did, for the time that you took, for the words that you spoke, for the money you put in the plate or gave to this ministry. Thank you for what you did. Because I got saved and I'm in heaven because of you. 30, 60, or 100. You're waiting. You don't know. Don't aim for six and a half, aim for a hundred. Someday you'll find out. Don't give up. We're waiting for the judgment of the wicked. Now you think, oh, that's pretty negative, Pastor Dana. <laughs> yes, it is, but we are waiting. There are many who get away with murder and think that that's it. They've gotten away with murder. They haven't. We're waiting for the judgment of the wicked. We're waiting for the revelation of Jesus. So many people say, get away from me with your religion. I don't want to hear it. You have no right to say that here. Somebody came up to my son on the playground at our public school. A friend asked him about God. He said, God is like this. And the teacher shushed him. You can't talk about that again. He didn't have a lawyer with him to say, it's my constitutional right. That was the spirit of the age. But someday Jesus is going to be revealed. There'll be no more, no more of this uh, quit your Christian talk. It's no good. Here he is, he'll be revealed. One day we'll be raised from the dead and our bodies will be transformed and they'll be perfect, they'll be glorious, they'll even produce light. Jesus called us sheep, fluffy, helpless, gullible, and delicious. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You know what? God in his wisdom takes these fluffy, gullible, delicious, helpless little things and says, judge angels. Whenever an angel appears, the angel has to say, don't be afraid, while well, somebody's heart's jumping out of their chest. And these little fluffy sheep are going to say, into the lake of fire, spirit of hatred, to hell with you, unclean spirit, fallen angels. Get ready, sheep. Get ready. These things haven't happened yet. You're waiting. They haven't happened. You got to count. You got to wait. You got to have faith. And if you're going to keep going and you're going to keep waiting and keep having faith, you can't grow weary. That's what it says. Uh, we'll reap a harvest if we don't come weary. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now the thing that just sticks with me, that maybe is the way to wrap this all up, is what the word weary means in Greek. It's two little vocab words. Like when you go to seminary and learn Greek, you learn a little smidgen of the Greek language, right? The rest you got to just learn how to look things up. And you learn this one word, which is probably why I mispronounce the um, cocoa powder, cacao. Cacao means bad. 
So uh, and then we get the little cacao nibs. I don't know how you pronounce those, but I always call them cacao nibs, probably because of the Greek class. It starts with a K. Cacao, bad. That's one word. The other is ek. E-K, it means out of or to. It's just a little, you know, a pronoun, maybe? I don't want to have bad grammar in front of the whole world <laughs> on the internet. <laughs> but anyway, it means bad out of. As in the internal place and you've gone bad. You cut a tree for firewood and you look in the middle, there's no wood in the middle, it's just rot. You cut an apple for food, after that green skin, it's just brown in the middle. It's gone bad in the middle. One of the commentators said, spiritless. Remember how God made people. He took dirt and then he breathed into them. And then you got mitochondria and DNA and your lymph node system and your hormones. You got an incredible body and a spirit and a soul. God has good breath. Amen. God's breath will do something. And if God's spirit leaves you, you're back to the dust. Don't be bad inside. Don't go bad inside. You've got to have spirits. you got to have soul. You've got to have the, the power of God in you. You've got to have hope. You can't give up. You can't quit. You can't say, I'll just rest now. Or I have too, too much. I've had enough. You don't get to say that. You don't get to go bad inside. You got to keep on. You got to have faith. You got to be in the Holy Spirit. You can't depend on what you can do in your flesh. You just have to go one more day with that which isn't finished yet. You can't do it. But if you have faith for one more day, God can. So, church, here we are at Crossroads. Maybe God wants us to be reborn today. I'm not seeing any big crisis except the world is falling apart and we're, <laughs> except that, and we're in a, a church's life cycle, all right? Uh, the, the, the writers who write about this stuff say there's a life cycle of the church. You start, then you have uh, momentum, then you organize the momentum, and then you got strength, and then you have maintenance, and then you got preservation, and then you've got life support. And then you become a restaurant or an art gallery. <laughs> the church building. All right? Or you were reborn. 140, maybe four years ago, Christianity, the gospel, the Holy Spirit came to this valley. And not everything worked out perfectly. Not everything in every church was done right. Not everything was done perfectly. But if you read the Bible, you see that's the way it was with people then too. Will God rebirth something among God's people in Haines? Maybe so. Is this the time? All I can say is don't quit. Don't go rotten in the middle. Don't lose your spirit. Keep on. Keep in step with the spirit. And see what the Lord has. Amen.